Today we're going to start talking about uh, policy instruments. Uh, I'm going to do that for two or three weeks. And today I'm going to focus uh, first on how do you actually decide whether a policy intervention is good or bad. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on two groups of instruments, uh, command and control and so-called institutional uh, instruments. Um, and then next week um, I'm going to talk about uh, market-based instruments, taxes, subsidies, tradable permits, essentially. Um, and then, as things stand now, we will skip week nine uh, and then move to uh, growth in the environment uh, in week 10. Um, first question, of course, uh, you need to ask uh, in every case is why do we regulate in the first place, right? Um, and for environmental policy, that is actually a fairly simple answer. If we're trying to provide public goods or we have a common good or a congesting good or we have a problem with externalities, then really the natural way of uh, going about providing these public goods or correcting these externalities is through some sort of public intervention. And for externalities, I will give you one uh, exception um, in half an hour or so, but really this is why you want the government to step in. Right? Uh, there's other reasons for the government uh, to regulate. Uh, you may have uh, market power, for instance. You may want to break up uh, a monopoly or tame oligopolies or monopsony for that matter. Uh, if we're talking about the labor market, <coughs> uh, you may have a natural monopoly, right? The difference between a monopoly and a natural monopoly is that with a natural monopoly, the benefits of competition are less than the costs, the extra costs of introducing competition. Uh, so a road network would be one example of a natural monopoly. Yes, you can have two road networks and have the road networks compete with one another, or you could have two electricity grids and have the electricity grids compete with one another, but those things are very expensive to build, right? So you <coughs> would rather accept uh, the monopoly and put some for, form of regulation on them to make sure that they don't abuse the monopoly power rather than introduce um, introduce a competitor. Um, <coughs> these are all fairly old. Uh, the last one is also fairly old in your eyes, uh, but fairly new in economic history. This is stuff that dates back to the 70s. It may be that different agents in the economy have different information and you may want to step in uh, there because, say, the seller knows more about the product than the buyer. The seller may abuse that knowledge uh, to scam uh, the supplier, uh, the buyer, right? Uh, and then as a government, you may want to step in. Uh, that is a relatively recent development uh, in economics if you want to regulate that. <clears throat> but then there is another reason why there is regulation, uh, and that is rent seeking. Sometimes actors in the economy, be it companies or NGOs or politicians themselves, use the regulatory powers of the government to enrich themselves or enrich their friends or family, right? Uh, and that is not something that should be forgotten. That is it not a reason why there should be regulation, but it's definitely a reason why there is regulation. Um, besides answering the question why regulate, and for environment it's simple, there's externalities, so you need to step in. Um, you also need to wonder what is actually the nature of the thing that we're trying to regulate, right? Uh, what is actually the problem? And you need to make a distinction between the types of pollutants. Are they stock or are they flow pollutants? Uh, is it noise or is it nuclear waste? Nuclear waste stays with us for thousands of years. Noise disappears as soon as you turn off the engine. Um, and you would approach things uh, differently um, with stock and flow pollutants. Uh, it depends on the medium. 
uh, the environmental medium that is uh, polluted, so if you're talking about water, air or soil, you would treat uh, things differently because things travel much more quickly and much more widely through air, through water, things travel typically more slowly but also in one given direction from upstream to downstream and um, whereas soil things are fairly stationary um, and uh, you can always remediate that by removing the soil or banning uh, all activity on that soil so you would approach that differently uh, you want a different approach for point and diffuse sources some pollutants come from basically everything uh, and everyone and cars would be an example of that, they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous, right? Uh, whereas if you're talking about nuclear power, it's four in this country, or five, and I'm embarrassed that I don't know the answer to my own question. Uh, but you have a few sources uh, of this, and it's uh, therefore much easier to find out what is going on, uh, and also uh, how to change things. Um, some of the times the impact is spatially concentrated. We worry about the noise of Heathrow, but only in the surroundings of Heathrow. We're actually not that concerned uh, about Heathrow noise uh, here in Farmer, but we may worry about uh, the parking uh, patterns of Catwick. Um, whereas something like UVB radiation is basically everywhere, right? Uh, and therefore it affects a different uh, population. Uh, similarly, local, regional, continental and global pollution would all require different types of actions and different types of actors, right? Local pollution is typically uh, the municipalities uh, or the county councils or the region, uh, regional authorities that step in, whereas if you want to solve a problem uh, such as climatic change, it's hard to get around the United Nations, right? Uh, you don't need the United Nations involved in your noise uh, policy. And all these things matter both for your understanding of the problem and therefore how serious a problem is to you, uh, but also on how you want to regulate um, and what you can do uh, to regulate. <coughs> um, and then your different interventions can be judged on a range of uh, criteria. How expensive are they? The first one. Uh, in terms of uh, the cost that you impose on uh, society, but there's also administrative costs. Some things can be implemented very cheaply, some things require uh, a lot of civil servants. Um, there's environmental effectiveness, right? We are regulating to clean up the environment, so we better clean up the environment, and some policy interventions do well on that, and some policy interventions do not so. Uh, good on cleaning up the environment. Um, you can think of beautiful plans on paper, but if it doesn't work in practice, then it doesn't work, right? If you come up with a great uh, regulation, but you cannot enforce the regulation, then what's the point, right? Um, and sometimes that is just by nature. Uh, but if you look at a country like uh, China, for instance, or a country like India, then a lot of, well, let's look at India, a lot of environmental regulations, and India has some of the strictest environmental regulations on the planet, right? If you look at regulation in, in environment regulation in India on paper, it looks absolutely fantastic, uh, on par with uh, the best that you see in Europe uh, and North America. In practice, because the courts don't work, and because a lot of politicians and a lot of civil servants are corrupt, the Indian environment is actually pretty dirty, right? It has nothing to do with uh, the legislation or the regulation and everything to do with their enforceability. Um, next week I'll talk about a long run effect and dynamic efficiency, that some instruments work same in the short run but have opposite uh, effect in the long run and that's obviously important uh, some regulations work fine if you know everything uh, some regulations work fine only if you know everything that is going on in the economy there's other types of regulations the regulator actually needs to know only very little uh, and that matters um, 
some regulations, some instruments are flexible and can be adjusted if new information arises and others uh, cannot. Uh, and then of course we also always need to look at the incidence of who is paying uh, for this. Uh, how much are they paying? Is it the rich who are paying? Is it the poor who are paying? Is it companies that are paying or is it households that are paying? Right? Uh, so all of these things need to be uh, considered. And I will consider all these things. I'm just announcing uh, the things that I'm looking at. Um, because this is a, an economics class, I'm going to put a little bit more structure on the first criterion, cost effectiveness. Um, and let's consider a uh, yeah uh, uh, a social problem right where we have uh, polluters denoted by n and there's a whole bunch of them so n runs from one uh, to capital n and they have the cost of emission reduction uh, that is given in the function that you see there beta n times n n m n plus one half times gamma n uh, times m n squared uh, so M is emission reduction, right? And if you don't do anything, you have zero cost of emission reduction. Um, and it's a quadratic function because otherwise the first order conditions look uh, nasty, right? Uh, this is a social planning problem. We want to minimize the total cost of emission reduction. Uh, so the sum over all CN um, and that is what we want to minimize, uh, but of course we also want to meet a certain target. We want our total emission reduction effort, the sum over m sub n, to be greater than or equal to our target m uh, without uh, any subscript. So how do you solve this? You form the Lagrangian, uh, that is just your objective function, the sum over cn, plus uh, lambda times the reformulated uh, constraint, uh, we formulate it as a, uh, an equality and bring one of the two to the other side of the equation. So that is m minus the sum over m sub n. Um, so that's the Lagrangian. So the first order condition for optimality is that the first partial derivative of the Lagrangian to the thing that we are deciding over, that is m sub n, because that's the decision that we make, uh, must equal zero. And now you see why it's a better function. Uh, because the L, the M, N is beta N plus gamma M, gamma N times M, N, right? That's just the first partial derivative of your cost function. And um, minus lambda, because the constraints, the M does not pop up there, right? Uh, but the M, N does, but also all the M, Ns that are not equal to N, right? For all the other uh, polluters. Uh, that's those, that first partial derivative is always zero. And uh, this is just, dmn uh, or dmn dmn so that is one right so we have simply lambda popping up there um, and what you then see is that you bring lambda to the other side of the equation and what you have is that the marginal cost of emission reduction c sub m is equal to lambda and this is true for all polluters n right um, and this is just an actually marginal principle, right? Essentially what we say is that if we have this joint constraint for all polluters, then the cheapest way of reducing the emissions is to make sure that everybody pays the same towards emission reduction at the margin, right? And mathematically the trick is that your lambda does not have a subscript. And it doesn't have a subscript because it's a joint constraint. Right? Um, so marginal cost should be equal for all polluters. Uh, the first guy to realize this is uh, Bill Bowmall, whose picture you see. Right? Um, but it's just an equi marginal principle. The cheapest way of achieving this particular target is um, to equalize uh, costs at the margin. Um, and that is cost effective, right? Now, there are people out there 
who use such words as more cost effective or less cost effective. And those are people who have not been paying attention to two classes, right? One, they're not been paying to this class because cost effectiveness is a supremum, it's an optimum, and you can't be more optimal, right? You're either in the optimum or you're not. So you're either cost effective or you're not. Um, so that is one class that did not pay attention to. And the second class that they did not pay attention to is Lakatos. That is, if you can, if you have a perfectly good and simple English word to say whether something is more expensive or less expensive, then you should use that word, right? So if you use the word, this is more cost, if you use the words, this is more cost effective than that, you're signaling that you did not, do not know what the word cost effective means, right? Uh, but also you try to impress the listener by using a word with lots of letters, whereas you could have just said, this is cheaper than that, right? It's a perfectly good English word for cheap and cheaper, right? It's cheap and cheaper, more and less cost effective. It's not English and it's just showing off in this case that you did not pay attention in class, right? Um, there's also people who use the word cost efficient rather than cost effective. Those are either people who have as their native language uh, English or uh, uh, German or French, or people who know that cost efficiency is the dual of cost effectiveness. And if you don't know what is a dual, or you don't know what is in the joint, then perhaps you should avoid the word uh, cost efficient, right? Um, because it's actually not an English word, apart from some highly specific jargon that does not quite mean what you think that it does. So, you want to say that something is cheaper, use the word cheaper, right? Okay, um, what sort of instruments are we going to look at? Um, so this week I'm going to look at the, the top ones and the bottom ones, and then next week we're going to talk about the market-based ones in a minute. Um, so command and control instruments, prescriptive instruments, direct regulation, it's all the same thing. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about those, and then I'm also going to talk about the institutional ones, knowing, of course, by now that if an economist uses the word institutional, he or she just means, I don't know, don't know quite what label to put in it, so institutional is just our word for miscellaneous or other, right? Um, I'm going to talk about voluntary agreements and property rights, and a little bit about information and awareness. Uh, <coughs> so, what is direct regulation? Prescriptive instruments, command and control. Uh, it's essentially the most common form of environmental regulation. Definitely in the environment, but more generally uh, the, the most common form of regulation. Um, and I think that is for two different reasons. Um, one is this is how natural scientists tend to think. This is how lawyers tend to think. And lawyers are always involved in any regulation and natural scientists are always involved in environmental regulation. And they just see something that they don't like, something that is killing birds or something that sets rivers on fire. And they said, we must forbid this, right? That is, seems to be their natural way uh, of thinking. Uh, there is another reason for this. If you look back at the European environment in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, it was dirty. It was very dirty. And I've showed you some pictures and told you some stories in the very first uh, seminar. Right? Um, and that problem has been solved by direct regulation. Those problems are no longer there. The European environment is much, much cleaner than it used to be uh, before you were born. And those people who sort of cut their teeth in environmental regulation as junior civil servants in the 1980s are now the senior civil servants uh, of the 2010s. 
and they look back at the start of their career and say we were very successful then by doing these sort of things why would we not why would we do things different now right um, so part of it is just uh, momentum and the, the problem is of course that environmental problems that we had then have been solved and the environmental problems that we have now are very very different um, and therefore you may want to change your tune uh, but it's perfectly human uh, not to do that. Right? So what is command and control? Essentially you tell people what to do, what not to do, and how to do it. Right? That's command and control. The government steps in and tells you this is how it must be done. Um, the problem with that is twofold. If you want to tell people in a sensible way how to do things, you better know what they're doing and why and how they're doing things and if your problem is the heavy metals that tanneries are putting in the Thames which used to be a problem right that they were uh, washing uh, <coughs> essentially tanneries make uh, use a lot of paint uh, and paint used to be very very uh, laden with heavy chemicals right and heavy metals and dirty chemicals and if that is your concern that all the chemicals and all the heavy metals that are being put in the river as essentially waste products of tanning um, then what you can do as a regulator you can sort of like go in and figure out what they're doing what sort of materials they're using and then say well perhaps we should switch to different chemicals and that makes perfect sense if the tanning industry is heavily concentrated and indeed the civil servant can go in and sort out what they're doing and they're all doing roughly the same thing and even though tanneries are all used to be all small businesses they all use the same technology they all use the same processes they were all structured in the same way so there you can imagine that the civil servant figures out, figure out figures out what is going on and proposes a substitute technology, a substitute chemical that would do the tanning just as well, maybe a little bit more expensive, uh, but would be much less harmful than dumped in the river. Right? So in order for this to work, the regulator, the civil servant who writes down the rules, needs to know what is going on. And that can only be the case if there's only a few polluters, like those nuclear power plants yes they're very complicated but there's only a few so you can sort of like sort out what they're doing we all use the same technology anyway um, and if people are using things in a homogenous way right uh, then you can imagine uh, that a regulation is correct um, and that hom homogeneity needs to be there from an informational perspective but it's also there from a legal perspective because as a regulator you cannot say I'm going to treat some companies in this way and other companies in a different way that would be discrimination right? so direct regulation is almost always one size fits all type of regulation because otherwise you're immediately in court for, discrimi for, uh, for discriminating one company uh, favoring one company over another right? uh, so what types of uh, direct regulation are there you can regulate the input uh, to consumption or production uh, so one regulation that is in place is the fuel efficiency of cars so if you have a car that takes a lot of uh, petrol to uh, drive one kilometer or one mile then you're not allowed to sell it on the European market right? you're still allowed to sell it in Nigeria and in India but not in the, in, uh, the UK uh, so that is an input uh, regulation right? Uh, another type of regulation is that you specify the technology that is used. 
So in Europe, if you want to sell a car, it has to have a catalytic converter. Otherwise, you're not allowed to sell this car, period. Um, and we have catalytic converters to take out uh, some of the precursors to uh, urban air pollution, uh, some of the particulates and some of the uh, chemicals. As a byproduct, uh, catalytic converters sort of get clogged up if there's lead in your petrol or diesel, and that's why we now have lead-free petrol and diesel. It's not, not actually uh, because we don't like lead, but because they mess up our catalytic converter. It's actually a good thing because lead is particularly bad for you, right? Lead uh, leads to all sorts of uh, cognitive uh, and behavioral problems. Um, but we clean it out of our fuels, not because we care about lead, but because we care about other things. And we weren't quite aware of uh, the implications of lead when we did this. <coughs> now, this catalytic converter immediately tells you something about uh, the cost effectiveness of this particular technology. Right? So the principle of cost effectiveness, the yeah. marginal principle, namely that the cost of, of emission reduction should be the same for all polluters. Now a catalytic converter costs 300 pounds, maybe 350 pounds, and every car needs to have one, right? So a car that is used by a traveling salesman that does 250,000 miles per year has to have a 350 pound catalytic converter. And that catalytic converter avoids a lot of air pollution. Right? So it comes at a very low marginal cost. A car that is only used to drive a little old lady to church once a week does not do a lot of miles, but it still has to have a catalytic converter for 350 pounds, and those 350 pounds avoid very little uh, emissions, right? So the marginal costs are high. So you may think that this is a homogenous technology, or almost homogenous technology. We have diesel engines and petrol engines, and that's it, right? And they almost have catalytic converters. So you as a regulator may think homogenous technology, homogenous regulation, thou shalt have a catalytic converter and I've solved the problem. But because the use of the technology is so very different between different people, you immediately induce a very different cost at the margin and on average to uh, the pollution being avoided, right? Uh, so this is an immediate example of why direct regulation is often not cost effective, right? <coughs> uh, there can also be regulation on the outputs, right? Um, so one thing uh, we have banned in Europe is to put paint with carcinogenic material in on um, toys that are for kids under three. Why is that? Uh, because kids eat everything and anything, right? Um, and cancer is something that we hate, right? Uh, so this is uh, a form of direct regulation. And uh, you can also put, uh, as we have, caps on the amount of sulfur that power plants can, em can emit, right? And that is why our coal-fired power plants, our UK's coal-fired power plants are now closing, right? Because they emit too much uh, sulfur. Um, you can put regulations on timing. On Gatwick, you can't take off before six in the morning, right? Because it makes too much noise. Other airports, you can't land after 11 at night. Uh, we are on the border of the South Downs National Park. And in the National Park, there are lots of things you're not allowed to do, like build houses. Uh, so that is a restriction on the location of activity. Um, and you can just, and that's the final form of direct regulation, you can just outright ban it, right? So chlorofluorocarbon CFCs, you cannot make them, you cannot sell them, you cannot buy them, and you cannot use them, right? Just for good measure we forbade all four things, right? Uh, so those are forms of direct regulation. Um, 
Okay. Uh, I was wondering where I was going. Um, so, the, this is just a derivation of cost effectiveness, right? Where I said that the uh, principle for a cost effective solution is that the costs are equal at the margin C, so M is equal to uh, lambda. The upshot of this, if this truly is the uh, cost function, is of course that if you solve this equation for M, then we find that the emission reduction target of company N is lambda, and lambda is the same for everybody, minus beta N over gamma N, right? So, the principle of cost effectiveness is that the costs are the same for everybody at the margin. It immediately implies that if different companies have different emission reduction cost functions, that their actual target is different. Right? They all get a different uh, target. But the emission reduction target is specifically its polluter. <coughs> um, and you can plug this uh, into the cost function. <coughs> so we know what mn should be, that's lambda minus beta n uh, over gamma n. And the cost function is beta mn uh, plus one half times gamma m squared. So we can just plug that solution in. And then we have uh, the costs uh, of each uh, polluter. Right? Um, <coughs> And you can sort of like work on two different principles, right? You can work on a cost effectiveness principle and say we want to equalize the costs at the margin. Uh, <coughs> but you can also, and that's much more simpler, give everybody the same target. When if companies are all the same size, and go back to the example of tanneries, they're roughly all the same size, um, because that's just the structure uh, of how that industry used to be. Um, <coughs> You can also just all give them the same target, right? And if then one is much more expensive, and in this case that's company B, is much more expensive emission reduction than the other, then uh, you would lead, uh, <coughs> you would get a different result, right? So if we impose that M should be equal for two different companies, A and B, uh, and they have total emission reduction of two, um, but the cost, total cost is six and, uh, seven and a half, sorry. Uh, if we impose that the costs are equal at the margin, and we still have the same uh, total emission reduction target of 2, then we can bring the cost down to 3.8, uh, right? So that is a almost halving of uh, the, cost, the total cost of emission reduction. <coughs> so that just illustrates cost effectiveness. Uh, but there's another thing that you see. And that is that if we impose equal reduction and company A pays one and a half and company B pays six, whereas if we impose uh, equal marginal costs and company A pays three and a half and company B pays point four, right? So you change the total cost we reduce the total cost, but we increase the cost for one of the companies, right? which then immediately has an incentive to lobby against this particular policy. Right? And of course, if this is your plan, then company B has an incentive to lobby against this particular policy. Yeah. This is the total cost. Yes. This is the total cost. And this is the cost per company. <coughs> right? um, which may partly explain why companies, uh, why we do not necessarily follow uh, cost effective, uh, the, the cost effective uh, emission reduction policies, right? There's another reason, um, and that is, so dif di different firms fare differently under different regulations and may lobby for the one that favors them, uh, and bureaucrats may not be neutral either. Right? Um, some regulations are easy and cheap to implement, others are hard and expensive. 
And if we have a neutral social planner, then of course uh, the social planner goes for the ones that are cheap, both to administer uh, and uh, imposes few costs on society. Um, but of course, if you believe uh, Niskanen's model of how bureaucracies work, then what Niskanen says is that really what bureaucrats are after is to maximize their desk size, right? The incentive of an individual bureaucrat is to get promotion and to have other bureaucrats working for them and to have a larger budget to spend on consultants and what have you. That is the motivation of a bureaucrat, and that means that you want to make things as complicated as possible, right? Because that means that more people will work for you on implementing this complicated uh, program. Um, <coughs> so here we have an example of greenhouse gas emission reduction in the UK, and I promise not to talk about climate change uh, this term, because I'm going to talk so much about it next term, but uh, this was the uh, best work example that I could find, best in the sense that it illustrates things, but it's also relatively simple and structured. <coughs> uh, so this is how much a UK firms, small and large, pay for CO2 emissions. Uh, and if you're generating power, then you pay a climate change levy uh, that is almost a hundred, uh, almost one pence a kilowatt hour, right? Uh, which, and then you look at how much CO2 actually comes out of making uh, a kilowatt hour of electricity that becomes uh, two pounds 40 uh, per ton of CO2 emitted, right? <coughs> You're burning gas for other reasons than power generation to heat a building, uh, for instance. Uh, you're only paying 10 pence per ton of CO2. Um, but you're only paying the full climate change levy if you don't have a so-called climate change agreement. If you do have a climate change agreement, <coughs> then you pay only, uh, I think, something like 75, 25% uh, of the climate change levy. You get a discount of 75%, so you pay only, that's not true, uh, it's a discount of 80%, right? Uh, you only pay two pence per kilowatt hour. No, per ton of CO2. So we immediately see that cost effectiveness is violated, right? I mean, CO2 is CO2, and some companies pay uh, two pounds, and other companies pay two pence. <coughs> But those climate change agreements means that you have to do other things and they are agreements that are negotiated between the company and uh, the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, definitely. So that involves lots and lots of civil servants, right, who go around negotiating contracts and agreements with companies. So if you are the civil servant in charge of this bit of uh, the government, this is a wonderful plan, right? Because you have lots of negotiators working for you, you have lots of inspectors working for you. This means that you're important, right? In Whitehall. So this is what the civil servants like. Um, <coughs> um, I said that if you burn the gas for heat, right? If you just burn gas, whatever it is, you use it as a feed stock or something. Uh, if instead you're burning it for heat and power, <coughs> then you're uh, subject to carbon price support. <coughs> um, and then you pay nine pence uh, per ton of CO2 emitted, right? So another violation of cost effectiveness. But then if you're a large emitter, then you're also under the EU ETS, but if you're a small emitter, then you're not. So, if you were to study at Imperial College, where they have a large combined heat and power plant, you're regulated by the EU ETS and by the CPS. But if you're a 
small university and you have a small combined heating power plant like uh, at Sussex, you're not subject to the EU tax. Right? So Imperial pays that nine pence plus some 20 pounds uh, for EU ETS permits, whereas Sussex only pays the nine pence, right? So immediate violation of the active marginal principle. Um, a fairly complex regulation that keeps lots and lots of civil servants employed, right? So the alternative would be a simple levy, a simple excise duty. And the good thing about an excise duty, if it's a new one, is that we have already excises on energy. Right? So we have all the administrative systems in place to levy excises on energy. Administrative systems both in government and in every company of note in the country and you could have just changed your excise on energy and that would have involved for the whole monitoring to civil servants uh, and that's it and administratively that would have been much cheaper right uh, than this fairly complicated scheme and uh, particularly the uh, climate change agreements uh, employ lots of people right and to what end in this case to make policy more expensive rather than less expensive. <coughs> um, now part of the problem with direct regulation is that governments do not, regulators do not necessarily know what is going on uh, in the polluting companies, right? So um, <coughs> there is uh, a push towards voluntary agreements and the CCAs that you see here is one form of voluntary agreement, right? Essentially, every company has a specific plan to reduce their emissions, right? Um, that's company specific. You can also do it industry wide, right? So that rather than imposing a regulation on an industry, there's negotiation between uh, governments and industry to reduce emissions. Um, and these are typically known as voluntary agreements, but they're not voluntary, right? Those climate change agreements, if you don't have one, you pay the full back of the climate change levy, and if you do have one, you pay only 20% of the climate change levy, right? So it is a voluntary agreement, but it's voluntary, right? Um, and often these things are negotiated under the threat of uh, Another intervention. Good thing about voluntary agreements is that they make optimal use of the information within industry. Um, so they're much more tailored towards what is a reasonable solution, right? What is feasible, what is cheap. Um, the problem with voluntary agreements is public acceptability. Because instead of the government going in and imposing regulations, the government goes and negotiates behind closed doors with representatives of industry and then comes up with a plan, right? So uh, environmental movement immediately smells a rat here. Um, why would you agree on uh, voluntary agreements? Um, the Colstead book actually has a neat example and I will tell you later why it is neat. Um, so let's assume uh, there are abatement costs and those abatement costs are different between a voluntary regulation, voluntary agreement and one that is imposed by uh, the regulator. Uh, so in both cases the uh, abatement costs are linear um, but voluntary regulation is cheaper than mandatory regulation because you use, um, you use the, the information, the available information um, better. Right? Uh, net social benefits are 
function of how much uh, you reduce it's some sort of function b, b of a where a is the amount of emissions uh, you avoid uh, and then you need to serve this the social benefits so you need to subtract uh, the cost of emission reduction minus cpa or cm right um, and then that is depicted uh, here where the dotted line the best line i should say are the marginal environmental benefits and uh, your cmca is your uh, your costs and the marginal costs uh, of emission reduction, right, which are just constant because that's, that, that cost function is linear. Um, and to argue uh, against the house, uh, we assume that the voluntary agreement not only comes at a lower unit cost, and a lower marginal cost, uh, but also is actually less stringent uh, regulation. Uh, still, you would see net benefits, right? Uh, because the benefits the, uh, of you will get is a little triangle there, um, which is entirely environmental, but there's an additional environmental cost because you go for a lower target, but there's actually a lower uh, cost of implementation. That's the square uh, that you see there, right? So industry avoids a lot of cost at the expense, in this case, of slightly greater uh, environmental damages. <coughs> But the construction of this example is such that uh, the square is larger than the triangle and there's a net benefit, a net social benefit of going for the voluntary uh, agreement, right? And of course we could have, I mean those the location of AV and AM are arbitrary and we could have swapped places, but then we would just be saying that voluntary agreements are always better, right? Because they're lower costs as well as better for the environment, lower cost to the polluters as well as better for the environment. So there's no interesting uh, story there, right? <coughs> um, right? So voluntary agreement is better from a social perspective than mandatory regulation. Um, but there is a third party uh, to this game. So there's the polluters and then there's the regulator uh, who has to decide whether or not to uh, go for uh, environmental mandatory, uh, mandatory re regulation uh, but there's also a legislator who doesn't quite trust anybody uh, but it's a legislation right so you never know what parliament's going to decide so there's a chance P of uh, adopting uh, regulation <coughs> uh, or implementing legislation so the structure of the decision tree then really is what you see here so in the first step the regulator needs to offer a voluntary agreement or not offer a voluntary agreement that's step one the state's one in the game and uh, then stage two is that the firm the polluter has to accept or reject the offer of the regulator and then after all this is done the uh, parliament may step in uh, with a probability uh, P and that uh, regulation or mm, whether it's on min one minus P do not, right? Um, so that is the structure of the decisions, right? Um, and if there is a voluntary agreement not followed by uh, action, then this is the payoff, right, to the firm, CV, uh, AV, and uh, the regulator, supposed to be neutral uh, and social planner, and that's also benefit that we just saw, and then you can work out uh, all uh, the other ones as well. <coughs> um, now, for the firm, the voluntary agreement, the offer by the regulator, uh, is acceptable if the costs of the voluntary agreements are less than the costs of the mandatory agreement times the probability P, right? Uh, and if P is 1, then yes, you would go for this. If P is 0, no, you would go, not go for this, right? So there has to be the threat of enforcement the threat of mandatory regulation, otherwise you would not go there. 
Um, the regulator has a different um, set of uh, constraints. Uh, a different motivation <coughs> is interesting in the net social benefit. And for them, the net social benefit uh, of the voluntary agreement has to be greater than the net social benefit of the mandatory agreement, again, times the probability of it being enforced. Right? <coughs> and if these two conditions are met, then we go for voluntary agreement. Otherwise, we go for mandatory agreement, although there's still a chance that the legislation will overrule everything. Now, why is this a neat example? Um, I don't think that the math actually here adds anything, right? It's almost common sense, and it's mostly notation what is going on. It's not that we did a manipulation and then all of a sudden an insight uh, comes out. So the math here just codifies common sense. Um, <coughs> a lot of economics papers are like this, that you see a lot of math, but in the end, nothing really happened. No new insight was generated. I could have just carefully chosen my words and said the same thing. Right? So this is a sort of math that people use to intimidate. There's two kinds of math, right? Sometimes you generate an insight with math, and sometimes you don't, but people think you are very clever. And this is an example of intimidation rather than insight, right? And it's important that you can tell the difference between the two. <coughs> so uh, this particular example just tells you, yeah, if it's beneficial for the firm to go for a voluntary agreement, then we go for a voluntary agreement. And if it's beneficial for the regulator to go for a voluntary agreement, then we go for a voluntary agreement. And if it's beneficial for both, because both parties need to agree, then that is what uh, would happen, right? Um, there's also voluntary environmental actions around greenness uh, and image, right? Uh, so companies may reduce pollution because their consumers demand this. And I don't need to explain this to you guys, right? Because this is a generation that does this all the time. A company gets a bad reputation because they killed somebody uh, or uh, they messed up their production or they treat their workers badly and you guys go immediately to a consumer boycott, right? And the latest example, of course, this week is the CEO of Uber uh, saying, yeah, they killed uh, Khashoggi. Oh, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that, right? No moral implications whatsoever. It was about as bad as us trying to uh, introduce self-driving cars, right? Point of Uber, right? Uh, yeah. So sometimes companies do green stuff because it sells, right? Or because they're afraid of consumer boycott. Um, <coughs> and sometimes it's just in their self-interest, right? So typically, products that are better for the environment are more expensive. And you can think of your commonly produced uh, agricultural uh, goods, say carrots. Conventionally produced carrots take a lot of fertilizers, take a lot of pesticides versus organic uh, carrots, they don't take uh, any uh, chemicals, right? Any pesticides to produce. The problem, of course, with not using pesticides is that half of your harvest is eaten by uh, all sorts of critters. Um, and that means that your green carrots, or your organically produced carrots, are more expensive to make. But there's also lots of people out there who think that organic is good and are prepared to pay a higher price for organic carrots over conventional carrots. Right? Um, and it may just be that uh, cost-benefit analysis is such that yes, this is the niche market that you want to be in. Um, another example, not on the product market, uh, but on the labor market, is that your workers may demand that you do good things, right? Um, 
And one example that is uh, close to my home uh, is Shell. So when I started studying, that's a long time ago, and that was a small program, and we all got to know each other, and one of the questions that was asked is, why are you studying this, right? And I studied econometrics, which is not quite economics. Um, and a lot of my peers, my fellow students, said, I want to work for Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, because an excellent company, high wages, very well respected, interesting work, that's the company most of my colleagues wanted to work for, right? But then, four years later, when we graduated, what had happened, well, apartheid had come along, and it turned out that Shell was in hoots with the apartheid regime in South Africa, and was locking up people and giving information about all those black people doing bad stuff in the eyes of the uh, white government, uh, white supremacist government in South Africa, right? And Shell had become so tainted by then, by this association with a racist regime, that after four years nobody wanted to work for them anymore, right? And people were sort of, previously you were proud of working for that company, now you would not admit to working for that company, right? <coughs> So previously, Shell had the first pick of the smartest people. Now they are only able to hire those who cannot find a job elsewhere, right? So this is an important uh, consideration. You also now, by now know roughly how old I am, right? Um, <coughs> or you can look it up. You can also look it up because it's public information, right? Um, so. <laughs> It may just be in the company's interest to be green, right? For all sorts of reasons. Some of these reasons are genuine, right? Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, greenwashing. So uh, Unilever <coughs> is another example of a company that wants to be very green. And this seems to be really driven by the preferences of their previous CEO, right? He was is an environmentalist, he's no longer CEO, and that drove a lot of the cleaning up of the procedures and the products of Unilever. So that seemed to be a genuine concern for the environment. Now they have a new CEO and things are changing. Um, some of it is greenwashing, right? My consumers care about the greenness of my image, and if I can convince them that I'm green without going green without actually going green, then of course I can still sell my products at a premium or I can avoid uh, consumer boycotts, right? Um, and for instance, what is going on at the moment in climate policy is that everybody thinks that Exxon is the bad guy. And Royal Dutch Shell and British Petroleum are just laughing, right? They think that Exxon is the bad guy. Now the companies are just as bad, but everybody is crossed with Exxon. Right? Um, and so some of this is actually just self-interest, right? This is uh, two pictures uh, I took in uh, the hotel I was staying in uh, last week. Uh, for those who can't read, saving the world one towel at a time. Right? So if you reuse your towel, they don't need as much water, they don't need as much detergents, they don't need as much energy to wash it, right? Um, and then uh, the second one, one plus one is minus 30 liters. Shower together, you'll say 30 liters of water and it's way more fun, right? <coughs> this is pure self-interest from the hotel's point of view. That, uh, it is true that showering together tends to be more fun if you pick the right person, uh, but the shower that they have is actually great, small to fit two people in, right? so it's a bit silly. Um, and it's true that you would use less water, right? And it's true that if you reuse your towel, uh, you would use less water and less detergent and less energy. Um, laundry is actually a major cost factor in most hotels. So yes, this is, this is not, they don't do this for environmental reasons, right? They try to convince you to do this for environmental reasons, but they save a lot of money if you do this, right? So this is pure self-interest. Um, 
not necessarily bad <laughs> for the environment, not bad for the economy, uh, but they don't do this for being green, right? Okay. Um, I think this is the last of my institutional, uh, my garbage uh, bag of policy instruments. Um, and that has to do with property rights in the coast here. And the picture you see here is Ronald Coast, um, who is one of the uh, Nobel laureates in economics. The previous picture that you saw was uh, Bo Moll, who shamefully did not get uh, a Nobel Prize. Um, but Coase uh, did, and he's one of the most controversial and peculiar figures in economics. Um, so, what uh, is, does the Coase theorem say? That the social optimum can be established for bargaining, bargaining <laughs> between polluter and polluter, and the outcome is the same regardless of the initial allocation of rights. Um, so how does that uh, work, right? So we have here a cost-benefit diagram. Uh, we've seen this one before, where we have the marginal benefits of emission reduction in green, and the higher the emissions, the greater the benefits of avoiding those emissions, right? Uh, so that is why it's going up. And then the marginal costs of emission reduction. <coughs> uh, so here we have the unregulated uh, optimum uh, the unregulated equilibrium and the further we push down emissions if emissions go to zero the more expensive it becomes to reduce emissions right and then what we have is that we have an optimal quantity q star or an optimal price uh, v star right so this is your standard cost benefit analysis so this is where the social optimum lies now let's assume that what we have here is a situation where uh, you are living in an apartment and you enjoy uh, quiet and then uh, this person moves in from next to you who plays the saxophone. And the saxophones are very loud and your new neighbor is not a very good saxophone player uh, but let's make it a him uh, and he likes to play a lot, right? Not very good, but very enthusiastic. <coughs> um, so you suffer from the noise, right? And the longer the saxophone playing goes on, the more annoyed you get. Uh, so that's the green curve. Uh, but yeah, after four and a half hours of playing your saxophone, your neighbor gets tired and sore lips and stops playing, right? Even though he would like to play, his lips are now so sore uh, that he stops playing, right? So that is the unregulated uh, point. Now, suppose that you are in a situation where there's no regulation in your building, that the landlord really doesn't care, there's no bylaws or anything in your building that says you shall be quiet. So what can you do, right? Uh, what you can do is knock on his door really loud uh, and say, will you please stop pay playing and I will pay you £10 uh, if you do so. So you can try and bribe him to play less. Right? Um, so uh, if we're at this point, this is your willingness to pay to avoid noise. <coughs> and the brown line is how much your saxophone playing neighbor would need to get in compensation to play less, right? So, uh, no bargain uh, can be struck there. But if we're uh, in this point, you actually see that you're willing, you're so annoyed that you're willing to give him a lot of money, and he was actually getting tired of playing anyway. So he's willing to accept only a little bit of money to play a little bit less, right? So if we're in this regime, actually a bargain can be struck. I am I'm doing this entirely wrong. Uh, if we're in this part, <laughs> actually, a bargain can be struck because you're so annoyed uh, that you're willing to pay a lot of money for him to play less. Right? And 
So if you're here, you're prepared to pay a lot. Please prepare to pay, uh, accept a little to pay uh, less. Um, and you're moving in this uh, direction until you're in this point and then you're no longer able to strike a mutually advantageous bargain, right? That's where it stops. Uh, so in this case, we actually, s the starting point is that you can make as much noise as you want, right? Now we can also be in a situation where there's actually bylaws in your building and a landlord uh, who enforces those where there is a right to silence and then it is your saxophone playing neighbor who's really annoyed because he would really like to play but he doesn't have the right so he could come to your door and say what if i give you 10 pounds and i can play for an hour right and you may think well can't hurt right you haven't heard him playing it uh, <laughs> quite realized uh, what is going on. Then you're in this situation, right, where the uh, saxophone player is prepared to pay a lot. You are not annoyed yet, so you are willing to accept a little, actually, for a little bit of noise, and you can strike a mutually advantageous bargain. Right? He may be willing to pay 15 pounds to play for an hour, and you say, well, that's worth, the annoyance is worth only 5 pounds to me, so if you strike a 10 pound bargain, then you're both better off, right? And that continues until you're in this point where there is no longer a mutually advantageous bargain to be struck. Because at this point, his willingness to pay to make noise is less than your willingness to accept compensation for that noise, right? Um, and regardless of whether you start in the situation that no noise is allowed, or you start in the situation that as much noise is allowed as possible, you always end up in the social optimum. Right? Through bargaining. Um, and that's the co-sphere. Um, And that says that as soon as it's clear whether there's a right to make noise or a right to silence, as soon as the property rights are clearly defined, through bargaining you find a uh, Pareto optimum. Right? Now, the first to write this up uh, was uh, the gentleman you see there, right, uh, Ronald Coase, and this is half of his Nobel Prize. Um, the other half has to do with the theory of the firm. Um, <coughs> and there's lots of assumptions that go in here, right? Uh, one assumption is that you can negotiate. And the negotiation itself is costless. Um, the other uh, assumption that you need to make is that through this bargaining process, you don't make mistakes, all necessary information is revealed. Um, another assumption uh, that you need to make is that I mean, there's a transfer of income going on, right? In one case, from your neighbor to you, in the other case, from you to your neighbor, that the transfer of income does not affect your willingness to pay for silence or his willingness to pay to make noise, right? So there's zero income in the system, strictly. Uh, and then, of course, in one case you're willing to, be willing to pay, in the other case you're willing to accept compensation. And I assume that those two are the same, right? And last week we talked about how they're not the same. Yes, we did. Um, so there's a lot of restrictive assumptions that go into the cost theorem. Um, but if you're willing to make these assumptions, then yes, this, uh, this works. Um, and as I said, he's a controversial figure. One of the things that essentially the Coase theorem does is that it separates efficiency and equity. Right? 
essentially what Coase says, regardless of who has the property rights to start with, you'll always end up in the same Pareto optimum. So it's not the second welfare theorem, right? The welfare, the second welfare theorem says that you can redistribute property and you will end up in a Pareto optimum. No, Coase says you will end up in the same Pareto optimum. So essentially then the market, the efficiency aspect is separated from the distribution of property rights, the initial distribution uh, of resources. And you can redistribute things, this is an equity question, without affecting uh, the uh, the final outcome, right? Uh, this is an efficiency question. <coughs> so that is what Coase said, um, and you can't argue with the uh, theorem itself, but you can of course argue with the assumptions you need to make to make it work, right? Uh, so one question that you may then ask, so is this just a curiosity or is this actually uh, working in uh, reality? Um, and I'll take you through a couple of examples and I'm going to start with examples where the polluter pays. Uh, and the prime example of that is, and I'll spend a lot of time in France, uh, mean de potas d'Alsace, right? Uh, this is a potassium mine in the Alsace, uh, as you may have guessed. Um, and they began dumping uh, chlorides in the river Rhine in 1931. They've been in operation longer than that, but previously they dumped their chlorides uh, into the local groundwater, and then the locals started complaining and they decided to dump it in the Rhine, and then it flows to uh, the Netherlands, right? Um, so problem solved from the perspective of the company, uh, but uh, the people in the Netherlands uh, were less happy uh, with this because most of the drinking water in the Netherlands comes from the Rhine, either directly or indirectly. Um, so in 1972, an agreement was made between the Netherlands, uh, France, Germany and Switzerland on an investment program in the mines to avoid dumping of the chlorides. And the numbers that you see here are that the Netherlands paid 34%, France paid 30%, Germany another 30%, and Switzerland remaining six. So essentially they agreed on a technical program to make sure that the chlorides didn't end up in the river. Uh, and then they decided to distribute the cost. Now you may wonder, why would Switzerland pay for this? Because if you know your geography, you know that Switzerland is further upriver, it's further upstream. So Switzerland is not affected by whatever the mines in France are doing, right? Because the water flows the other direction. And the same is true for Germany, actually. The political activities in Germany are upstream of the mines uh, in France. The reason for this is that the Netherlands was making such a stink that this problem has to be solved and the Swiss essentially had the choice do we pay the French to clean up the problem so that the Dutch will shut up or do we clean up our own industry? And they reckoned it was cheaper to pay the France to clean up their mess. And the same is true for Germany and that is why the cost distribution uh, is as it is. So we have here polluters paying to avoid pollution elsewhere, right? Um, so that is uh, what is going on. The uh, agreement was revised uh, some 20 years later. Um, the Swiss no longer paid because the company uh, that was uh, offending uh, had one of the companies, one of the offending companies had gone bankrupt. Um, the uh, Dutch contribution to this, the 34% that you saw previously, is nowadays being spent in the Netherlands. It's spent to uh, enhance, to, to uh, purify drinking water, um, <coughs> which immediately implies that if all the Dutch contribution 
um, close to the Netherlands, that this is pure polluter phase, right? So the problem, the pollution, pollution problem is in the Netherlands, but it's the French and the Germans that pay to clean up, even though they don't suffer the consequences from this, right? It's other people who suffer the consequences. So this is an example where the polluter uh, pays. Um, an important thing to note here is that no ports were involved. Um, because if we think back uh, to the origins of the tort of nuisance, right, uh, in, since 1201, in common law, the polluter typically pays. And this goes back to a ruling uh, of King John, and uh, the top picture is what King John looked like in my youth, right, and the bottom picture is what he looked like in your youth, right, so this is John Lackland, right, the antagonist uh, of Robin Hood, um, and also the guy who did the Magna, did Magna Carta, right? You know, like to say, the Magna Carta. Um, um, and there was a ruling uh, by King John against uh, Jordan the Miller. And what Jordan the Miller had done was he thought that uh, his pond wasn't big enough and his mills weren't turning fast enough. And he had built an additional reservoir and flooded more land, but that land was actually owned by this guy called Simon of Merston. Uh, so this is a clear externality, right? The miller needs more water power and you need to extend your reservoir and what do you do? You flood your neighbor's land. And the neighbor took uh, Jordan to court and King John ruled, no, 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 this is not allowed, right? So, and this is the so-called tort of nuisance in common law. And in all common law countries, you essentially, you cannot bother your neighbor in this or any similar way since the year 1201, right? Because the common law works by precedent. <coughs> and since 1941, um, this um, has been extended across international borders. The famous trail smelter case is a case of a, a smelting plant in Canada Essentially, they were working uh, ores to get uh, iron and nickel. It's, an, it's a nickel uh, <coughs> melter. Uh, so they were working ores to get a nickel out. And uh, of course, all sorts of air pollution. And the air pollution mainly landed across the border of British Columbia in uh, Washington State. Um, and that was taken to an international tribunal and essentially the tort of nuisance was extended across international borders and uh, the company was told to clean up its uh, clean up its mess right and pay compensation for the damage uh, that was done so this particular aspect of or this particular implementation of the code <coughs> theorem where the polluter is playing the saxophonist in my example the right to silence, the right not to be annoyed by your neighbor, is actually a fairly well-established principle in law, right? So in the US, where there is a form of common law, uh, we see a lot of examples where the polluter is indeed paying, the pollutee, but it's typically done either after a court case, or under the threat of a court case, or just to make sure that there won't be a court case. Um, and one of the things that you see happening regularly in the US is that a power company or a chemical company just buys up the village next to the facility and says, if there is an accident, then all these people would be dead and I would have to pay their relatives lots and lots of compensation. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to buy all those houses and kick them out, right? And that is actually something that you very regularly see happening in the US. That is a large industrial facility and then this hamlet next door. And then the hamlet is just bought out, right? Um, <coughs> but it's hard to see this as a real example of um, the 
the Coase theorem because there's always this court case uh, presence, right? Um, and now I'm getting my words wrong, right? Um, because this slide should be called the polluter phase rather than the polluter. Um, and uh, there's simply a crucial typo <laughs> here, I'll correct it. Uh, so there are examples where the polluter phase so this is where you go in, there's no right to silence, and you bribe the saxophone player next door to stop making noise, right? Um, one example is uh, Vitel. Uh, you may have heard of Vitel because they're a uh, relatively well-selling brand of uh, spring water. Um, and they're now own, nowadays owned by Nestle, and Nestle does this across brands uh, of its company. Uh, so what they're doing is they're paying farmers, people who hold cattle or uh, grow barley near its springs to reduce the use of fertilizers. And they want to do that because actually the farmers are doing perfectly legal things. They're using fertilizers up to the legal limit and that's it, right? Uh, but those fertilizers seep into the groundwater, they seep into their wells, and that means that there's too much nitrogen and too much phosphor in the well water, and that means that Vitel or Nestle can no longer sell this as ultra clean spring, spring water. So they're violating not the <coughs> agricultural standards, the farmers are doing things that are perfectly legal, but they're violating the food standards or in this case, the drinking water standards, or the spring water standards, right? Uh, so what does Vitel do? Essentially, it's paying those farmers to do things differently. Essentially, they're paying the farmers to be organic farmers to not use any fertilizers. That means that their products, uh, their crops don't grow as well, their uh, cattle don't do uh, that well, or they have very complicated and very expensive manure management systems uh, to take the shit from the cows uh, out of, to keep the shit from the cows out of the, the groundwater. Uh, and Nestle is paying those farmers to do that, right? So that's a very clear example where the polluter, the victim of the pollution, uh, pays. Um, another example, New York City has bought uh, 100,000 acres of land in the Catskill, Delaware watershed. That's where most of the drinking water of New York comes from and they had a choice between two things either they could build an expensive water treatment plant or they could just buy up the land that put all these chemicals uh, into the water and say we're just going to turn this into a nature reserve and they reckoned it was cheaper just to buy out uh, the landowners and let the land go fallow, that's what they've done. And it's the polluter, it's the victim of the pollution. It's the victim of the chemicals and the nutrients that ended up in the water uh, that is paying for this. Uh, another example across uh, borders uh, are Sweden and Finland, who after the wall came down, Before the war came down, they were worried about the amount of stuff that uh, Eastern European countries put into their rivers and into the Baltic. Uh, but after the war came down, there was a bit more congenial atmosphere. Uh, and Sweden and Finland essentially paid for the cleanup of industry in Poland, in the Baltics, and to a much lesser extent in Russia. In Russia, they tried, but they never quite could get the program together because Russians are so corrupt uh, that they were afraid that they would just give them money and the money would disappear uh, into, uh, Putin wasn't in place then, uh, into Yeltsin's pockets uh, and Yeltsin's cronies' uh, pockets. Um, Japan tried, tried to do the same with China and Taiwan and Korea and the Philippines and so on and so forth, uh, but the Japanese program was not nearly as successful as in what it uh, 
It's a clear example where Japan was worried about the air pollution flowing from Taiwan, flowing from Korea, flowing from China to uh, with the winds to Japan and they said well rather than suffer the consequences or rather than try and argue this in court we're just going to try and bribe them uh, to, to do this, right? Um, now one of the issues with the um, Coase theorem is that you can imagine bargaining between you and your neighbor, right? Or you can imagine bargaining between Finland and Lithuania. But it's much more difficult to imagine bargaining with a large number of uh, victims. Um, <coughs> But it actually, or with a large number of polluters, um, but it can actually uh, work, right? So um, the municipality of Santa Maria, which is in uh, California, avoided this sort of coordination problem with a large number of victims of pollution by essentially acting on their behalf. Uh, so there was a feedlot, right? That's where they. Uh, fatten pigs to turn into pork. That's what a feedlot does. A feedlot does. Um, and it's very, very smelly. Uh, the pigs don't smell good. And lots of pigs uh, and a very small pot smell particularly bad. Uh, so, but you can't really say, well, I'm living next to it, next to this feedlot. I'm troubled by this. I go negotiate with this big company next door. That doesn't work, right? What you need is some sort of collective to do this. Uh, and you need coordination and collaboration between all the neighbors uh, and that did not quite work out but what did work out for them is that they convinced a the municipality to do this for them right so rather than self-organize they convinced the municipality to act on their behalf and they came up with and i told you that regulation needs to be one size fits all <coughs> But local taxes also needs to be one size fits all, but if there's only one feedlot in your municipality, right, then of course you can introduce a tax that applies to all feedlots in your municipality. And if there's only one, if the one size does fit, right? So essentially they impose the tax on the houses nearby um, and use that money to buy out that particular company, right? And the tax that was imposed is, of course, all houses within a certain distance of a certain agricultural activity, and that is the specific tax that was introduced, right? Um, final form of uh, coordination, and then I'll shut up, um, is that sometimes you need to, you have sort of one victim, but you have a lot of polluters, right? Uh, and how would you solve that particular um, coordination problem. Well, with the Nature Conservancy, in one case together with the Environmental uh, Defense Fund, in another case uh, on its own, um, did in one case they just raised money. Everybody was offended by fishing uh, methods that were used off the coast of, I believe, California, uh, and they used that to buy out the fishers. Right? They just said, uh, we're going to raise money and we're going to use the money to buy those boats uh, that we don't like and we're going to save dolphins and we're going to save tuna uh, and that's it. Right? And simply buying out fishing rights, they're buying out fishing equipment and they solve the coordination problem by acting as an intermediary. Another case, uh, again the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy uh, was worried about the demise of wetlands and wetlands are particularly important for migratory birds and the birds were migratory so they needed the wetlands only in March and the problem was that a lot of the wetlands were converted to rice uh, but rice growing but in March you're not growing rice so the wetlands were essentially dry right the paddy fields were essentially without water um, so the Nature Conservancy got worried about what that does that do to the migratory birds. We're again uh, in California. They raised a lot of money, as you can do in California, uh, for these sort of things. And then they used a reverse auction 
to pay the farmers <coughs> to keep their lands flooded well into March so that the birds passing by would have a place to forage, right? And they solved the coordination problem in that way, in two clever ways. One, they, there's lots of people who care about this and they sort of use crowdfunding to solve that particular part of the problem. And then there's lots of polluters, so you have a two-sided coordination problem. And then they found the cheapest way of doing that by this reverse auction, right? They let the farmers bid against each other until they had enough land to support the birds that were passing by, right? So it seems <coughs> that Coes was not entirely nuts, right? That these things, the sort of bargaining over environmental problems, regardless of whether the polluter is paying or the polluter is playing, paying, can work. In practice, it can solve things that, in this case, the state government or the federal government is not prepared to do. Um, and it can even work when there's multiple players, either multiple polluters, multiple pollutees, or in case of the uh, rice farming um, and the fissures where there's multiple polluters and multiple pollutees, and you can still solve uh, the coordination problem uh, in that way, right? So this seems to be a viable uh, solution. Now, what I have not done is compare these instruments uh, but I'm planning to do that next week anyway once I introduce the second set of instruments Texas subsidies and tradable terms right so I see you guys next Tuesday